Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our worship service. I pray that you have had a blessed week. And so as we open up our worship service, a couple of announcements that I just want us to uh, remember. The church will remain closed until further notice. Um, if you do have... Um, if you do hear any information in regards to uh, this, please do feel free to reach out to me and let me know more about this too. But as of now, uh, our church is, both churches in Marysville and also in um, Oroville will remain closed until further notice. And so for those in the, for those in Oroville, you can still send your pledges and your offerings to the church address like I've been uh, letting us know, we do have a new mailbox, so it is much more secure, so you can feel safe in doing that. So uh, our church address is on the screen here. So not only that, um, I do encourage us to send in some videos of you leading some worship songs or some worship hymns. If you can, send those in. If you can add the words, the lyrics to that video, please do so. And I would like to play those um or include those during our worship services. And so today we'll be see seeing one of those videos, um, but I I would like to receive more from us. So if you can, uh, do send in some videos of you leading these worship songs or hymns, whichever one you want. You go ahead and just choose it and you send it in and I'll take a look at it. And when I feel that it's, um, it's appropriate for our worship service, I will include those into our worship service and not only worship songs and hymns but i also encourage us to send in some special songs too okay that was the special songs you you don't necessarily need to add any uh, any lyrics or anything like that to the video um with the worship songs if you don't know how to add the lyrics uh just send it to me and i, I can add that i can add the lyrics to the worship songs too so i just i would just want to encourage all of us to get involved in the in our worship service uh because this is our worship service and so I do encourage us on that, and um, you know, at this time, there is no more announcements, so I'm just gonna announce these same things in Hmong. I do the Paul, I do pay your church, not your pay you are not pay the church, you need your car, okay? Pay church, stop keeping your church, not to say that's on you, or pay Hila, no, like a Malik head, put or pay your Jing Shada, okay? Chitana Su, pay your Jing Yoto Ho. Orville, not your yard, the name war, or net your pledges, net your near to Lula, she, or no, um, it's a bar near the whole church, no, like they sat out of a hot turn yaw, or your hot forty five Acacia Avenue, or the meeting yard on that video, the law, and they sat out of pain, not yet. Pick the lump a little mailbox, like the church, like the little mailbox, the little mailbox, or John Pudope, then they sat on a la pay, or let you pitch it such a hot, the Jamutusha near the island, the Nayad Hopel mailbox, a tattoo on it, you don't you to call it, you pin what to shut on here. Pay your mail, the she and a little long, long pay, no, 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 mailbox, the lot, and they sat on a lot of good, no, 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 we will be we will now start our worship service and we will be starting our worship service with a song that a it's a very popular worship song called Word of, uh, heart of worship heart of worship by matt redmond and today it'll be led by windy and song so please do join us for our opening worship song
Thank you so much to Wendy and Sam for leading us in this opening worship song, Heart of Worship. Let us pray together. Father, once more, we come before you to worship you on this beautiful day. It is always an honor to be able to just come together as a church family, regardless of where we are at, to be able to worship you together as one family on this day, Lord. We pray, we pray that you will open up our hearts to your words today. We pray that you'll open up our minds to your words today. May this worship service here be a time of blessing to each and every single one of us. Let us see your glory. Let us see your face. Let us carry our cross before you and walk with you, Lord. And so we lift everyone up to you at this time. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And we'll be having our second hymn. It is Blessed Assurance. Please join us for this hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washing His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. It is time for our joys and our concerns. And at this time, I would like to lift a couple people up for prayer. And also, if you have any uh, anyone that you want to lift up for prayer, please do include those into our comment section. And I will read that out to everybody. So I want to lift up our brother Jim Webster up for prayer. I spoke with him early yesterday. And uh, he did share that one of his um, daughters passed away. And so please do pray for Jim and his family. I also want to lift up a brother from Marysville, Chai's family. Chai's father also passed away. His father has been battling with Parkinson's for the last 10 years or so. And um, so his father did pass away a few days ago. And so I want to lift up Chai and his family 
in prayer at this time also. And not only that, I also want to lift up the people of Texas and also all those people across the country that are dealing with these snowstorms and these horrible weather conditions. And so I want to lift all of them up to prayer today. And so, like I said, if you have anybody else that you would like to lift up in prayers today, please do put those in the comment section. Let us pray at this time. Because she be talking to you, okay? Want you to be like she? Want you be how how to nakalu soon there? I want you to know you be to know what you to pay her got to you. Be to hold her. Go in group be can go only. So you look at Lunyo touch now. You look at Lunyo. O pay money down, yan down cha. You don't need to pay. O pay no shen chop la la. Want you got to chop chop be pot chay. Go chen yan down that pay. Go chen chop pay chop king chay. Want you be zhong she can go only. Want you to tell us if you can book a payment technology. So, you're in the law. Put out the pay to know okay to pay her go again. You're just one who's Sunday watching. It's a your pay not a bat or chat. It's a your pay pay her go show. Who saw two or young in the nostril of one tree, a pay you power to call you young and die pay. She chop a poor jelly watch you. Want you to talk a shy your pay to a bit of hawking team with a yacht on days. You want you. You can yonder jade on the pay. It's only so do. So, Lucy, her watch you. I want you to know that you are not a good person. 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 Ono tu cai hot top chop pesha dah cai, tapi macam lu saya tak senang pergi kucing pawai dia, beli dia, ni hot chop pesha dah cai. Tapi siapa yang cipai mon jam tu jam cipai ni mon fikir dia pura kau, tapi cipai ni cipai mon tan top pesha. Di neng orang ni nu tak senang ni tau, hot pelu tak cai dengan, especially jangan tau hot lu state Texas macam cipai orang lain jam, the snowstorm, orang lain. Mon tau yang tau cai orang lain ni orang siapa lagi macam cipai cipai mon. Là chú mua phê phá, chú mua thơ mù, tôi khỏi tư văn chú, chú mua hít tới giả trọng người ta vì tới snowstorm nó văn chú, vì tới hô tế chôn nó chí trọng văn chú. Ê văn chú bê mô là phí tế chá bù đô con, tôi lưu xe tạch nó thỏa cầu vô tư sai, tôi xí hô thỏa cầu tư, cho là cho hô kì mô tôi giả tận tế văn chú. God, we just thank you so much as always for this beautiful, awesome, wonderful, magnificent day. As we're able to gather together to worship you, Lord, even if it is on Facebook, even if it is online, we know that you are here with us in the midst of our worship, Lord. That your spirit is with each and every single one of us on this day. And so as we come before you, we just want to lift up our brothers to you. We want to lift up Jim to you. He recently found out this past week that his daughter passed away. She was found unconscious, Lord. Lord, we, we lift him and his family up to you. We pray for them. We pray for them. We also want to lift up our brother Chai from Marysville up to you also. He lost his father this week also. His father was a great man. He was a good man. Very, very good man. A faithful man in the Lord. He's been suffering for the, at least the past 10 years or so. With Parkinson's and now you have led him back home you have taken him back home her hearts break with both Jim and also with Chai her heart breaks with her family as they lost their loved ones yet we ask for strength for both of them for both families we also ask for strength for our church 
as we lose these wonderful people, Lord. Let us have faith and let us remember that although they are no longer here with us, that they are in a better place, that they are in paradise at this time. And so let us celebrate in that also, Lord. Not only that, we also want to lift up those across our nation who are battling with these weather conditions, with these terrible, terrible snowstorms all across our nation, especially those in Texas, especially those who have lost the electricity, they've lost heat in their homes. They're unable to go out to find food, we pray for all of them, Lord. Many of them are stuck inside their homes because of these terrible, terrible conditions. We pray for them, Lord. For all, from all the elderly to all of our families, to all of our children, to our pets, we pray for all of them. That you be with them, Lord. Protect them during this difficult, difficult time. So much has been happening in our nation for these past couple of years, Lord. We just ask, we just ask that you continue to watch over us. Continue to be merciful towards us, Lord. Forgive us for we have sinned. And restore our nation, heal our nation during these difficult times, Lord. May you bless us with eyes that we may look upon you during these difficult, difficult times. And so we thank you so much for everything that you've given us, even in our pain and even in our sufferings. May you receive glory, Lord. And so together as a family, we pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ once taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I just want to share a little song with um, a special song with all of us. It is a song in which I chose in the past to uh, represent, kind of represent, tell the story of my life. And uh, as many of us know, and I've explained this to us a lot of times, that in the Hmong culture, when you get married, typically your in-laws give you a new name. And uh, that's what the T-Z-E-R in my name uh, comes from. Um, comes from my in-law and of course the chang that part is my my legal name and that part is the my birth name given to me by my parents but um and so when, when i when when i had the party for when when my in-laws gave me um my name uh, this was a song that i chose to tell the story of my life and i i think many times we often have this misconcept that as christians that all of our trouble was all of our the trials of life are supposed to be gone and we're supposed to live a happy, we're just supposed to be, be living this happy, joyful life with no, with, with no issues, with no problems or anything of that sort. And oftentimes that is not true many times. And even as Christians, that we, we face many trials. As Christians, many times we face many, many different types of temptations in our own lives. And you know, even in my own life, I, I face many things, many trials and, and trouble and, and um, things like that. And so, uh, but one of the things that I always remember, at least for myself, is this, that no matter what situation that I may be in, no matter what trials, what t temptations that I, I may be facing, what, whatever hardship it is that I may be facing, the important thing is that God receives glory and that the Lord receive praise in all of it. And, and God has, God has you know, done marvelous things in my life. He's even turned all my pain, all my sufferings, all my trials, all my hardship into something that's positive for my life. And not only that, he also take these things and, and through these things, he's also been glorified. And so I praise the Lord for that. And so um, today, as we as we um, as we're, we set our hearts to listen to the word of God, before we do that, I just want to share this song with all of us. It is a song by Mercy Me. The title of the song is Jesus Bring the Rain.
I can count a million times People asking me how I can praise you With all that I've gone through The question just amazes me Can circumstances possibly change Who I forever am in you Maybe since my life was changed Long before these rainy days It's never ever really crossed my mind To turn my back on you, oh Lord My only shelter from the storm But instead, I draw closer through these times So I pray The dark clouds that may loom above Because you are much greater than my pain You who made a way for me By suffering your destiny So tell me what's a little rain So I pray
Okay, well, thank you for joining um, joining me for that special song there. And that's uh, part of that is also to encourage all of us to, uh, or anybody who is interested in uh, doing some special songs for our worship service on Sundays to um, do a video and send those videos in so that I can include them into our worship service every every uh, on, on Sundays because we I'm sure we all want to see you okay and so I do encourage us to do that and um, at this time we'll be going into our sermon and we also have the monk sermon on this link on on our inside our uh, comment section here if you want to listen to the monk sermon instead feel free to go ahead and just go there and click on the monk sermon the link is for the U YouTube video there and so feel free to just, just click on that but as we go into our live stream here sermon, it will be an English sermon. It is about the transfiguration. It's about the transfiguration. And the title that I have given to this sermon this week is called Christ Revealed. Christ Revealed from Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to verse 8. I'm sure we all know the story of the transfiguration. And I just want us to study this this week and go into a couple points here. Because it was the <clears throat> this event here took place during a time in which the disciples needed they needed that assurance as they as jesus christ was getting ready to go into jerusalem to suffer and to die on the cross and it was tough it was tough for the disciples um to to really understand what is going on here and so it is it is something that gave them assurance at this time and, and let me read the bible verse here first before we go into the sermon and so i'll be reading like i said from mark chapter 9 verse 2 to verse 8 um if you have your scriptures one of the things that i want to encourage us to do is uh, you know bring just bring your bible bring your bible to a worship service because i want you to be able to read along with me as i read these uh scripture here and uh, i want you to be able to Follow along with me as, as I talk about these uh, scriptures here. And here, here's, this is what it says in Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to verse 8. Um, I'll be reading from the ESV version today. And it says, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them and there appeared to them elijah with moses and they were talking with jesus and peter said to jesus rabbi it is good that we are here let us make three tents one for you and one for moses and one for elijah for he did not know what to say for they were terrified and a cloud overshadowed them and a voice out of the cloud said this is my beloved son listen to him and suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone, anyone with them, but Jesus only. Let us pray together. God, as we open up your words to seek your wisdom, we ask for you to guide us with your spirit. Empower us with your Holy Spirit. Let us understand these words. And yes, as the disciples stood before Jesus Christ, as his body was transfigured, and they saw Elijah, they saw Moses, and they even heard the voice of the Father, they were terrified indeed. They were terrified indeed. For it is an experience that no man, no person can ever truly describe how it is to be in the presence of the glory of our Lord when His glory is shining through and we see Him for who He truly is. This time was a time of great assurance for the disciples as they struggle with the fact that their Lord Jesus was going to go and suffer in Jerusalem they struggled they struggled with that so much they could not believe that that was going to be God's will for their Lord Jesus Christ they couldn't believe it at all it was difficult for them and they needed this assurance before them so that they would truly see the glory of the one that they follow and so today, we also want to see that glory, Lord. We want to see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ on this day. As we start out the, this first Sunday of Lent, 
to reflect upon our own mortality and also to reflect upon our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to see his glory for who he truly, truly is. To give us the faith to carry our cross in this life. Knowing that one day we too will receive this marvelous, marvelous glory. And so as we begin to study your words, we lift everyone up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. To, to understand, to understand this passage or these passages here, we must understand. We must understand the background and the scenario here as to what is going on. This event of the transfiguration here took place or takes place about six months before Jesus Christ's own crucifixion in Jerusalem. And this event of transfiguration here also took place right after Jesus Christ had just done revealing to his disciples of his plan, of the plan to go to Jerusalem, to go there and to suffer and to die. Of course, if we were to read in Mark chapter 8, or if we were to read in Matthew chapter 16, the event that preceded the transfiguration was the time in which Jesus Christ took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, and he asked them who they believe he was. And in that, Peter, being the boldest of all the disciples, declared Jesus Christ to be the Messiah. And it was after that when Jesus Christ started explaining to them that Jesus Christ was going to go and he was going to die in Jerusalem. And we see, we see Peter's response to this. Peter was saying, no, that can't happen, man. That can't happen. We, we're not going to allow that to happen to you. And so he took Jesus aside and he even rebuked Jesus at that time saying, this is not going to happen. We're not going to allow this to happen. And this is where we get that famous line from Jesus when he rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. Of course, he's not calling, in this case, he is not calling Peter Satan, but he knows that, that the devil was tempt, tempting Peter at this time. A lot of times the will of God is not according, does not go as according to our will. And so a couple of weeks ago, when we studied from the gospel of Mark, we studied about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We studied about how he entered into the synagogue and how he started teaching in the synagogue and how people responded to his teaching in the synagogue. Here this week, by studying in Mark chapter 9 here, we are going towards the end of Jesus Christ's ministry. By this time here, by the time of the transfiguration, Jesus Christ has already been in ministry for at least three years. For three years, he has been in ministry. And so his disciples have been following him for three years. They have heard all of his teachings. They have seen all the miracles that he has been doing. And of course, we, we, we've discussed this so many times that their whole idea of following Christ was to overcome the Roman Empire was to destroy the Roman Empire, was to be able to rebel against the Roman Empire because they felt that they were being oppressed. And they, they were. They were being oppressed at that time. And so that was their whole hope as they were following Jesus Christ. And here, after three years, Jesus Christ is telling them that in about six months from now, I'll be going into Jerusalem. And when I go into Jerusalem, I will be arrested and I will be put on the cross and I will be crucified. And this was difficult, difficult for the disciples to understand. It was difficult for them to accept. And that's why Peter rebuked Jesus saying, I'm not going to allow this to happen to you, Lord. This event of the transfiguration is not only here in, Mar in, in the Gospel of Mark, but it's also recorded in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 17 and also in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. And this also took place, this, this whole event here of the transfiguration also took place during the Feast of the Tabernacles. 
And what that is, is it's, it's a tabernacle, it's, it's a feast in which they come to remember their exodus from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. And they, as they come into the wilderness, they were living in these small shelters. And so every year they would have this feast of tabernacles to remind themselves that as they were being free from, from Egypt, as they were in the wilderness living in these small tents, and these small shelters that God was with them. And so all these things are very important for us to understand exactly why Peter is doing the things that Peter is doing and why Jesus is doing the things that Jesus is doing and why there's three three uh, witnesses, why, why Jesus Christ took three witnesses with him. And at the same time, we also have the picture of three witnesses from heaven, the witnesses of Moses, Elijah, and God the Father. And so all, understanding all these things really put the, the whole picture of the transfiguration together. Because we see in the scripture here that it says that Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And so Jesus took with him three disciples. Three of the disciples are, that are the most closely or are, are most close to him. And he took three of these, these disciples with him, and he led them up this high mountain. Now, why would he take three disciples? We, we may ask that question. I don't know if you've ever, ever asked that question before. But there is a purpose in everything that Jesus Christ does. There is a purpose in everything that he does. And the reason why he took these three disciples with him is because it is in the Jewish custom that in order for something to... to, to um, to be factual or in order for us to trust in something, in order for us to believe in something, there needs to be two or three witnesses. That is the Jewish custom. If there's only one witness, then the, then then they don't they don't see that as something that is credible. And so they need at least two or three witnesses for something to be credible for them. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We see this throughout the 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 culture of the Jewish people. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, it refers to this. It says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. And so we see this. We see this concept here in their culture that there needs to be at least two or three witness in order for something to be credible. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 16, Jesus Christ repeats the same thing. He repeats the same thing here that was in the Old Testament. He, and he's talking about when a brother or a sister, when someone sins against you, you go and talk to that person. Once you talk to that person, you're not able to resolve any issues with that person. Then how do you proceed from that? And Jesus Christ says, if he does not listen, okay, that person who has sinned against you, you go talk to them. If they do not listen, then this is what you are to do. Take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So there it goes again, that principle in the Jewish custom, that principle in the Jewish culture. That idea that you need to have at least two or three witnesses because one is not enough. Jesus Christ also goes on in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, and he also says, Who, Wherever two or three gather in my name, I am there. Another repeat of this, this standard in the Jewish custom. And then Paul, Paul said the very same thing to young Timothy. He wrote the very same thing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19. He says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And so it's a constant thing. We see here it's a constant thing. It is a standard for their culture, a standard for their time. And so this is the reason why Jesus Christ took three disciples with him. Because he understood that in order for him for in order for something to be credible for the people of his time, for his culture at that time, that he needed two or three witnesses. But the interesting thing about this also is that it wasn't just three disciples that witnessed Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ 
And the disciples arrived at the top of that mountain, on Mount Horeb. There's also three witnesses of heaven, or three witnesses that came from heaven. And we see those three witnesses as Moses, as Elijah, and as God the Father. And it is in these passages here in verse 4 where it says, There appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And then in verse 7, it goes on and says, A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. So not only is Jesus Christ showing us here that there are three witnesses uh, that, that were his disciples, but then there were also three witnesses from heaven to declare Jesus Christ as to who he was, to declare about what they have seen of Jesus Christ. And so the whole point of this from the gospel writers and also from our Lord Jesus Christ is to reveal to us who he truly is. Is to reveal, to, to testify to us who Jesus Christ truly is for the purpose of giving us assurance as we go through these difficult times that we can be assured that no matter what happens, no matter what trials, what, what temptations, that what, what hardship we may face, that we can always be assured of who Jesus Christ is. We can always be confident of who Jesus Christ is. In other words, Jesus Christ, what he's doing here is he's saying that I have fulfilled the, the standard, I have fulfilled the laws, I have fulfilled everything that is needed to be fulfilled. I have fulfilled these things. I even have three witnesses from three three men who 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 witnessed me, not all, three men from earth and three men from heaven who've all witnessed who I truly am. They have seen my glory on the top of this mountain here, and this is who I am. And the disciples needed this so much during this time because they just couldn't grasp the idea. Of suffering. They couldn't grasp, they couldn't understand the idea of the cross. They couldn't understand the idea of the, of the crucifixion. And they kept saying, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. We don't, we, we don't want this to happen. We don't want this to occur. And Jesus Christ says, don't worry. This is who I am. This, I am the Son of God. I am, I am God myself. And so Jesus Christ is assuring them through the transfiguration that they can find the, the strength and the faith to go through these times of trouble. I can only imagine when Peter was being hung upside down in Rome many years ago. I can only begin to imagine what, he, what Peter was thinking to himself as they hung him upside down on the cross to crucify him. It must have been this event here, the thing in which he witnesses with his own eyes that kept his faith going even though they were killing him, even though they hung him upside down on that cross. And so we as Christians, it is so important for us to see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so important for us to understand who he is as Jesus Christ. And I know, like I've been saying, we've been talking so much about this because it is so foundational to everything that we do. If we have just one small misunderstanding of Jesus Christ, we can be led astray. So we need to know who Jesus Christ is. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He is not only man, but He is also God Himself. He's not just a teacher. But he is the one that they have prophesied about for thousands and thousands of years. He is the one. He is the Lamb of God. He is the sacrifice, the one that bore our sins for us on that cross to take away the sins of this world. If, if he was merely just another man, he would not be able to, to bore our sins on that cross. But it is because he is not only man, but he's also God. That he's able to take away the sins of this world. And we are able to stand before God with no fear. Because the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ covers us. You see, we never go before God through our own righteousness, through our own works. 
if we're to do so, we'll be so consumed that we would, the word of God tells us that if we're ever to go before God, we, we would just die. But it is only through the covering of Jesus Christ, through his righteousness and through his works that we're able to approach God ever. And this is who Jesus Christ is. Now, what is the transfiguration? What does the transfiguration, what does this mean here? We see in the Old Testament, we see in Exodus chapter 34, we also see, we also see an instance of when Moses' face was shining as he was coming down from Mount Sinai. But there, but there is a tremendous, tremendous difference between Moses' face shining and the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why Moses' face is shining is because God was, he was spending time with God. He was spending time with God and, and, and he was receiving the laws from God. And so because he was spending time with God, then God was shining upon him. And so his shining came from something that was external. But the transfiguration of Jesus Christ here, as his body was shining, as his face was shining, the word transfiguration here is not talking about something that was external. But this word transfiguration here that, that is used to describe Jesus Christ is talking about something that comes from the inside of Christ. Warren Worsby, one of the theologians of our time, he said this. He said, the word transfigured describes a change on the outside that comes from the inside. So that's a big difference. That's the big difference between what was happening to Moses as Moses' face was shining and what is happening to Jesus Christ as he was on that mountain and his body was changing. He was being transfigured. Moses' face was shining because of something that was external. But Jesus Christ, his body was transfigured. His face was shining because of something that was inside of him, something that was internal. John Wesley explained the transfiguration as this. He says, it is the indwelling deity darted out its rays through the veil of the flesh. And that was such transcendent splendor that he no longer bore the form of a servant. His face shone with divine majesty like the sun in its strength. And all his body was so illuminated by it that his clothes could not conceal its glory but became white and glittering as the very light with which he covered himself as with a garment that's how john wesley described the transfiguration to be like and once again the emphasis here is that this transfiguration this change was something that was coming from within jesus christ was coming from inside of jesus christ and so in other words, what Christ was doing, when he took upon the flesh, when he took upon the flesh, he suppressed his glory. He suppressed his glory. But inside, he was always, he, he remained God. That glory was still within him. And Mark did his best also to describe this event, this situation in verse 3 when Mark says that his clothes became radiant intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them you see that's how mark described the event and if we if we look in revelation chapter 21 20 uh, verse 23 we will understand the glory of our lord so much more better when it says that there is no more need for the sun or the moon or anything of that sort for the lamb okay the lamb referring to jesus christ is its lamp once again, referring back to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How glorious he is. How magnificent he is. How wonderful and powerful our Lord Jesus Christ is. And so here he is, the glory of Jesus Christ, just being revealed on this mountain before these witnesses as they gaze upon his own glory. And for so long as he took upon that flesh, he, he suppressed that glory within him. But here on this mountain, he understood that these disciples needed this so much because they were about to see something that they were, were not expecting. They were going to go through suffering and pain. And so he needed to reveal to them that he is the glorious one. He is the son of God himself. And we even see his glory in the Old Testament. 
You see, every time someone in, encounters God in the Old Testament, they are encountering our Lord Jesus Christ. We see Moses, when Moses encountered the glory of God in the Old Testament, the Word of God says that Moses bowed at once and worshipped him. The same thing happens to Ezekiel, as Ezekiel describes the glory of God in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27 to verse 28. Ezekiel says, I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like a glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. The very same thing. The very same thing. What Moses saw in the Old Testament on Mount Sinai. What Ezekiel saw during his calling in the Old Testament is the very same thing, the very same glory that was revealed to them on Mount, on that mountain many, many years later to these disciples, to these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, the very glory, the very same glory that they see. And if we were to fast forward from the time of the transfiguration to the time of revelation, John once again, through his vision, describe what he also saw at that time. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16 through verse 17, John says, His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell, I fell at his feet as though dead. We, we just, one of the things that we often forget, we often forget about the glory of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. We often forget about how, how glorious, how holy our Lord Jesus Christ is, that nothing can ever compare to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that, 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 that you know, we just can't take anything in this world and, and compare it to Jesus Christ. So we're to look at Moses, and Moses says that Moses bowed at once and just worship him. And we look at Moses and we see that, you know, Moses grew up in, in a palace. So all the greatest things, all the most beautiful things in life on this earth, all the gold, all the silver, all the most valuable things on earth, Moses has seen with his own eyes. And yet when Moses sees the glory of the Lord, Moses realized that I have not seen anything ever like this, that, uh, that I cannot take anything and compare it to this at all. And so the only thing that he could do when he saw the glory of the Lord was just to bow down right away and just to worship him. And Ezekiel said the same thing. I just fell face down, face down, putting his face right into the ground, just, just laying down flat on the ground. You see, we're not talking about just kneeling here, guys. We're not talking about these, these um, men of the Old Testament seeing the glory of God and, and just kneeling before him. That's not what we're talking about here. We are talking about them seeing such great glory that they fell face down. They just laid straight down on the ground, putting their face right into that ground, right into that dirt before the Lord. And saying, Lord, that's all, that's, that's all I am. I am nothing but dust. I am nothing but dirt. And when I see you, that's all I can do is lay down on this dirt to acknowledge my own mortality before you, Lord. And isn't that what Ash Wednesday is about? Isn't that what Lent season is, is all about? It's, us, it's all about us reflecting on the glory of our Lord. And just realize our own mortality before him. That, man, we, we don't even deserve to be in your presence, Lord. That if we, we just catch a little glimpse of your glory, that our lives is changed forever, forever, and forever. Matthew describes this event in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. He says, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Luke describes this in Luke chapter 9, verse 29. He says the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. What a wonderful thing it is to realize the glory of God. Our life will always be changed. Our life will be transformed if we just catch a small 
glimpse of that glory that belongs to our Lord. And many times we come to church, but our lives are never changed because we never catch that glory of the Lord. And everything starts from that. You see, Christianity is not about us being saved. Christianity starts from the Lord being glorious. Christianity starts right there with understanding that there is nothing like God. We cannot understand what it means to be humble until we understand how glorious the Lord is. We cannot understand what it means to be forgiven until we understand how glorious and how holy the Lord is. We cannot even begin to understand anything. His grace, His mercy, we cannot begin to understand these, these things until we understand His holiness, until we understand how glorious He truly is. Because the lesson of the transfiguration is not only about what Jesus Christ revealed on that mountain, but it is also about what he withheld. It is also about what he gave up. It is also about his own humility, his own humbleness before us. And like I said, in order for us to understand how much he gave up to take upon the flesh, to die on the cross, to take our place. He who is without sin was made into sin. In order for us to understand the extent of this, we must understand his glory. We must understand his holiness. We must understand that. And so this lesson, the lesson of the transfiguration, is not just about what he revealed on that mountain, but it also shows us his own humility, what he withheld, what he gave up, what he suppressed in order for him to save us. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 8, it says, who, who, this is referring to Jesus Christ, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of his servants, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What are you going to give up now? During this Lent season, what are you going to give up? You see, Jesus Christ gave up this, this glory that he had. Even though he was, he, in, 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 the, in his very nature, he was with, equal with the Father. But he gave that up. He gave it all up. And he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is what he gave up. This is what he suppressed. This is what he withheld in order so that he can save you, so that he can save me. During this Lent season, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to withhold from yourself? So many times all these things distract us from our relationship with the Lord. We never really realize. We, a lot of times we, we often forget how much God, the Son of God, gave up for us. That's what fasting is all, all about. When, when we give up, when we, when we fast from food, we realize the immense love and grace of God of our Lord Jesus Christ how much he was willing to give up for us so it's a time for us to really reflect upon this during the Lent season as today we start that Lent season the very first Sunday of our Lent season we need to give up something many times we want God to give us all these things God uh, I want this I want that but when it comes to us just giving up something, for comes to us suppressing something, withholding something, for the sake, for the sake of building a relationship with the Lord, we refuse to do so, and we allow these things to distract us from our relationship with the Lord, and so we must ask our question during this Lent season: What am I willing to give up? And there is Peter again. 
there's Peter again as, as all these things were going on before Peter. And just as Jesus has told him days earlier that, the, that Jesus had his supper, yet here was Peter again, not knowing exactly what to say. And so the only thing that he can come up with, because, like I said, this was happening. This event was happening during the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so the only thing that he could think of during this time was that, hey, Jesus, why don't we just build three tents for you? Three little ta tabernacles, three little shelters, or three little boots. Boots for you, for Elijah, and for Moses. Now, what are the thoughts that are going through Peter's mind here? Well, we have to understand, once again, we have to understand what the thoughts were at that time during the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was a time of celebration, a time of great joy, a time in which the suffering is now over and God is now with us. We're, we're, now, we're, we're no longer in Egypt anymore, and, and the, the Lord is now with us. And so what was Peter thinking? Why would Peter say these things the whole idea that Peter had was that, Lord, look, we now see your glory. We, we're now sure of who you are. We, we even see Elijah, and we even see Moses coming before you and testifying as to who you are. Now, now, now we're sure. Now we are sure who you are. So why don't we just skip that whole thing? Why don't we just skip that whole thing with Jerusalem? Why don't we just skip that whole thing with the cross? Why don't we just skip that whole thing with the crucifixion? And let's just build these tents here because you are now with us. And let's just live and, and just live in glory here in the, on this spot. We, have now, we are now victorious. So there's no more need to go to Jerusalem. That's the thoughts that's going through Peter's mind during this time. A few days earlier, he was just being rebuked by Jesus Christ, saying, don't do that, you know, Satan, get away from me. And here, Jesus Christ is assuring Peter and the disciples as to who Jesus Christ is. And the first thing that came, comes to Peter's mind is, hey, we know who you are now. Let's get the cross. We don't need to go through that. We don't need to go through the suffering. Let's just build these tents here, live here, because you are now here with us, and we can live here in glory for the rest of our days. And many times in our own lives, and many times as Christians, that's what we want, isn't it? We want to skip the cross, and we just want to go straight to the glory. We just want to receive the glory. We just want to celebrate the glory right away. That's what Peter thought. He, he thought that we could just do this without the cross. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, there is no way around the cross. There is a glory to be had. There is a glory to be had. But to get to the glory, we have to carry the cross. And that is the reason why Peter was once again rebuked by the Father this time, you see. A chapter earlier, he was rebuked by the Son, and now he is rebuked by the Father. In verse 7, it says, A cloud overshadowed them. That cloud reminds the disciples, of course, the, the disciples were very well versed in this Old Testament. All Jewish people were at a, were very, very well versed in the Old Testament at that time. And so the cloud overshadowed that cloud represented to them, that pillar of cloud that God the Father was leading them through the wilderness. And so once again, that cloud appears on top of this mountain and it overshadows them and the voice the voice of the Father comes and says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Once again, Peter is rebuked this time by the Father. The whole point here to Peter is that Peter, the cross is something you must carry. And that's something that for us, something we must carry also as Christians. That's what we need to do, especially during this Lent season. Of course, we carry that cross every single day. But during this Lent season, it is a time for us to really reflect upon what that cross means to us. There are just no shortcuts in life. And so oftentimes we want to take shortcuts in, in, life, in our life. 
even in our own personal life. So many times we want a car, but we don't want to pay for it. We want a job, but we don't want to study for it. We want a business, but we don't want to work to build it up. We want a house, but we don't want to take the time to look for one. We want a successful marriage, but we don't want to commit ourselves to loving the one that God has given to us. All things that are of any real value in life requires hard work. That's what it means to carry the cross. And many times we want a church, but we don't want to serve. And that's why God is rebuking Peter. That's why the son and also the father now is rebuking Peter, saying, Peter, Peter, you're going to have to carry that cross. And this here, this here, the, the glory that you now see on this day is something that you are to remember as you go through the sufferings of carrying that cross and this is what you need to assure you that it will be well worth it in the end to carry that cross and follow your Lord Jesus Christ and so I want to ask us today are you ready are you ready to carry that cross are you ready to carry that cross are you re ready to put in the work are you ready to serve the Lord? Are you ready to serve each other? Are you ready to reflect upon how glorious our Lord Jesus Christ is? Are you ready to lay straight down on that ground like the prophets of old did before the glory of their Lord and just lay down? That is the whole way of admitting to the Lord, their own admission to the Lord that we are nothing but just dirt. We are nothing but just the dirt of this this, this this world and we are so undeserving of being in your presence are you ready to reflect upon these things during this Lent season the Lord have loved us so much that he, have, he has given us all these things to assure us of who he is Yes, so many people still will not believe, and that's okay. If you don't believe in the glorious of the Lord, if you don't believe in the holiness of Jesus Christ, if you don't believe that he is the Son of God, then you don't need to do anything on this day. I, I'm not asking you to do anything on this day. But if you believe in his glory, if you believe in his holiness, if you believe in who he is, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that created all th things, that, that, he, that through him the, the world and the universe, all things in heaven and on earth was created. If you, if you truly believe this, then there is no other rational response to this than to carry your cross on this day and to follow him knowing what is ahead for you, knowing that there is a glory for you to be had in the future. And so let me conclude by saying this, that the lesson of these, these passages here taught us this, that the identity of Christ was revealed. And not only was it revealed, but it was also affirmed to us. And we can trust in who Jesus Christ is through these witnesses, the three witnesses, Peter, James, and John, and also the three heavenly witnesses of Moses, of Elijah, and of God the Father. And so today, we can trust who Jesus Christ is. We don't need to doubt it anymore. We don't need to doubt it anymore. And that this glory that Christ has is a glory that one day we will also possess. But to receive that glory, my friends, my brothers and sisters, to receive that glory, we must bear our cross. There is no way for us to get around the cross. And that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the apostle Paul wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. That's what kept Paul going. That's what kept Paul going through all the sufferings and all the hardship during his lifetime, all the way up to the points that he was killed for his faith. It kept him going. 
because he kept his eyes upon the glory of the Lord. That's the only way. That's the only way for us to be able to keep going. As, as me, myself, as, as, I, as I was going through many issues in my life, many hardship in my life, that was the only thing that kept me going. The glory of the Lord, keeping my eyes on the glory of the Lord. My very ser first sermon to us in the, our church here was to talk to us about the sufferings of the Hmong Christians after the war. And the only thing that kept many Hmong Christians going was the glory of the Lord. They kept their eyes on the glory of the Lord, even through all the sufferings and pain that they had. And so today I encourage us to carry our cross. Don't try to take a shortcut, but to carry our cross. And through this, continue to keep our eyes upon the glory of our Lord that was revealed to us on that mountain many years ago. Let us pray. Lord, how wonderful it is. We always need assurance in our lives because as we journey with you through this earth and in our faith, many times we often forget about who you are. Oftentimes we get distracted from who you are. And it causes us to set our cross aside. And we want comfort. We want blessings. But we don't want to walk with you, to fellowship with you in your sufferings. But Lord, please, on this day, please, please give us the faith and the strength to be able to go through the trials that we're going through, the hardship, the sufferings that we're going through. As we carry our cross, please keep our eyes upon your glory helping us understand that the glory is to come, helping us understand that you have already overcame death and you yourself is already victorious and we too will receive victory as we carry our cross through this earth, through this life. So as we conclude our worship service, we ask for your blessings to be on all of us until we meet again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we will be having our children's Zoom service at 12 p.m. And so um, if you do have children, I encourage you to join us for that. Thank you so much. And God bless all of you. Until next week, we'll see you again. Amen.